before he goes to meet this widow, had already begun to be persecuted because of his faith, had already begun to, let's see if I can fix this, had already begun to, I don't like this thing, I never have. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, had already begun to uh, have this unfair treatment. And so the Lord had sent him to a valley, a place where he could uh, be safe, and also a place where there was a brook during this time of drought. And it was uh, there that he found himself for a while. But after a while, the brook dried up. And so then he was called by God to go to Zerap, this, this place where he would eventually go and meet this widow. And then we have the rest of the story as we heard read for us this morning. I was a pastor of a church one time where we had to get into a pretty big and unfortunately eventually public battle with the Department of Transportation. It had been in the Marietta Daily Journal. Now in the end we won. Yeah, we won. But anyway, uh, uh, not too long after that I ended up having to be at the doctor's office for let's just say an uncomfortable procedure that was not at all pleasant and it was quite awkward in addition and during that procedure the physician says so I've been reading about your church in the paper and I see y'all really had to go through a fight how did that go really you're asking me that now you want me to talk about how God worked things out for us in the midst of uh, this awful procedure? It was just a little of an example of one of those times where I was asked to do what I thought was unimaginable in the midst of a situation that I already thought was unthinkable. And that's going to be the theme of our passage today. So stay with that idea. You know, I, when I come to a time to share, I read and pray and meditate on the passages of Scripture. And one thing I promise promise never to do is to just give some platitudes or easy answers because I don't think they exist and even if they do they never really work very well. I try to find some way to draw out of maybe the theology of the passage something that I think is applicable and hopefully practical. The reality is sometimes life is messy. Sometimes life is difficult. And that was certainly true throughout this whole passage. And what I take from that, maybe simply put, is that sometimes in the life of a believer, unthinkable things happen. But even as we're going through those unthinkable things, sometimes God is going to call us to do something that we find unimaginable. Elijah here was a man of God. Here was a prophet. Here was somebody that was obedient. Somebody that was courageous. And he was being forced to hide. That's unthinkable. That's unfair. God tells him to go to this ravine. And for a while during the drought, he is given the opportunity to gain sustenance from this brook. But after a while, the brook even finally dries up. Boy, that seems unfair. Boy, that seems unfair unthinkable. And as he's already dealing with the unthinkable situation of the brook drying up when he's already hiding out because of treatment that's so unfair, God calls on him to go to Zarephath. And that is unimaginable to him. And why is that? Because Zarephath is the hometown of his enemy Jezebel. Woo. That would be unimaginable to me. And by the way, Zarephath literally means crucible. So Elijah was being asked to go from the frying pan into the fire. That's just the first of the situations that Elijah finds himself in in this passage where I know if it were me, I would have said, seriously? I can't even imagine doing that. In an unthinkable situation, being asked to do something that's unimaginable. But he does. He goes to Zarephath. And when he arrives, he encounters this widow. God had said, you're going to encounter a wind widow and she's going to provide you sustenance. And he meets this widow. Guess what? She's gathering sticks for a fire because she tells Elijah, I'm building this little fire to cook my very last meal and then myself and my son are going to die. That's the person you want me to ask for help? That's unthinkable to me. Here's this woman in desperate straits. And you want me to 
ask her? You're expecting me that you're going to provide through her? That had to be unimaginable for Elijah. And then, of course, this woman and her son in this unthinkable situation of knowing that, and they were, they were near death. Very, very soon death was coming. I can't imagine a more unthinkable situation. And here is this man she never met asking her to do something unimaginable. He asks, actually asks her to do two things unimaginable. First he says, feed me first. And then he says, have hope. He says, God will provide for you. I don't know which of those was more unimaginable. Here she had been through this long struggle, extreme effort, and you know by now, she'd given up. And she is called upon to do the unimaginable, to have hope in this situation, in these unthinkable circumstances that she finds herself. Later on, her son becomes ill. Her son who was her joy and most likely her only hope for her own future. He grows worse until finally he dies. The most unthinkable thing of all, the loss of a child. Carl Jung once said, it's when the period comes before the end of the sentence. This young man that had been so loved by his mother and I'm sure now by Elijah too. There was so much pain in this unthinkable situation. This woman feels targeted and guilty. She asks Elijah, did you come here just to remind me of my sin and to take my son's life? And then here's Elijah trying to do the right thing, feeling called on the carpet for the outcome of this. Not only that, he's now going to be expected to pray. And if you check through the scriptures, you find up till this point, nobody had ever come back from the dead. So he was being asked to pray in the most unimaginable way. Both Elijah and this widow are being asked to do unimaginable things in the midst of unthinkable pain. They were being asked to exercise faith when it looked like it was too late. And what good would it do? Do you see yourself in this passage anywhere so far? Are you dealing with unthinkable things in your life? In the first case, Elijah was dealing in the unthinkable situation of being treated so unfairly. Here he's trying to do the will of God and live a, a good life. And there's awful consequences. That's so unfair. Have you ever been treated unfairly? Boy, those are the times you usually want to lick your wounds, right? Those are the times you want to say, I love self-pity because what would I do without it? <laughs> the time where the boss takes the credit for your work. Or where you lose a job and the other people who stayed are really stupid. That's so unfair. Or we find ourselves being hurt Someone's talked about us and our friend has believed them over us and they don't want to be our friends anymore. Those are just a few examples of the kind of situations we might find ourselves in that we say they're messy, they're unfair, and it's unthinkable that we got there. What I want to say to us that our dealing with her dealt with the unthinkable is God still, even in those times, might ask us to do the unimaginable. What might that look like? Because God says mercy triumphs over justice, God might say to us, you forgive them, even if they haven't asked. God might say, you show kindness to them, even if you're right, they don't deserve it. Show kindness anyway. Boy, that's not our nature. I don't know about you, but it's not my nature to do that. Several years ago, I was in a fast food restaurant that I won't name, and unfortunately, I found a roach in my drink. So, being the humble and quiet person that I am, I asked to speak to the manager, and I said, we probably want to speak in private. She said, no, just stay there. Well, I'm standing there looking upset in front of the restaurant, so of course, a customer comes up and says, what's going on? And I started to tell him. So, the manager yelled at me. Not a good choice. <laughs> So eventually, let's just say I heard from their attorney, and 
Their attorney said, we are so sorry this happened. Can I send you $50 as a sign of our regret? I said, 50 doesn't sound very sorry. Make it 100. <laughs> it's not my nature to do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable. I don't know about you. Do you see yourself in the second case? This widow's in the unthinkable situation of starving and even more so, her son is going to die as well. Here's a man who says he's a prophet, but she's never met him before. And he says, feed me first. She didn't have enough for herself. An unthinkable situation and now she's being asked to do the unimaginable. Sometimes God calls on us to give out of our need, not our plenty. You know the story in the gospel where the woman contributed her two mites, all she had. She gave out of her need, not her plenty. You know, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and one time one of my older brothers said, another name for the offering basket is the mite box. Not knowing that scripture, I said, well, why do they call it? The might box. He said, well, sometimes we might put our money in. Sometimes we might not. <laughs> I thought that for a long time. But what it shows me is we have a choice in these times that we find unthinkable. What choice are we going to make? Are we going to give out of our need or only out of our abundance? Are we going to give even in the times of inability or even in the times of ability? You might have some tough financial times and then run into somebody who needs you to be hospitable. You might feel like you're not the one to be asked to do this task that we need to have done in the church. After all, that's not my capability. We might have an opportunity to minister at a shelter, but we might say, but I'm not always sure how to act when it's somebody that's homeless or in deep need. Those unthinkable situations, God sometimes says, do the unimaginable and give out of your need, not your plenty. Give out of your inability, not your ability. Give out of your discomfort, not your comfort. And then, of course, this third case that was the most unthinkable of all. Illness, diagnoses, loss. The times where it is too late. In spite of trusting God, it didn't work out the way we had so hoped it would. This young boy passed, despite a mother who had trusted God by giving up her last meal, despite a prophet who had continued to be true, despite being hunted down and treating unfairly. Sometimes unthinkable, unthinkable things still happen. I won't pretend they don't. I won't try to sugarcoat it. I won't try to lessen their impact. But sometimes God still says, do the unimaginable. Find enough faith to say to yourself, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Trust in God. Sometimes he says, even in the most unthinkable, do that that's unimaginable. See, God is sometimes going to call of us in the midst of our unthinkable situations to do the unimaginable. Maybe it's to move beyond unfairness to being merciful. Maybe it's to give beyond our inability and trust God to meet the need. Maybe it's a time to trust when we have so much hopelessness that it would physically hurt to try to be hopeful. But see, in each of those cases, Elijah doesn't wallow in self-pity at the dried up brook. He goes to this widow's home in Zarephath and he found acceptance, safety, and sustenance. This widow, instead of denying this man who asked for her last meal, instead of striking out in bitterness and woe is me, she gave beyond her need and God provided. And in the third case, we find that even in the hopelessness of the most painful lost, God was trusted and her son came back. At the beginning of my message, I mentioned the first part of this theme, that sometimes God asks us to do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable. But here's the rest of the theme. When we 
trust God just enough to do that unimaginable and the midst of the unthinkable, he provides in ways that are unsurpassable. Unsurpassable power, unsurpassable mercy, unsurpassable grace, unsurpassable goodness. When we are asked to do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable, God provides in ways that are unsurpassable. God provided that way of escape and provision for Elijah. God provided when she came out of her need with the provisions the widow needed. And God displayed resurrection power in spite of heartache, despair, loss, and hopelessness. That's how God works. I ask us to think of situations earlier where you might have found yourself in this passage. And I just wanted you to think about if you found yourself in unthinkable situations asked to do the unimaginable. Maybe like Elijah, that time of unfair treatment. But remembering that mercy triumphs over judgment, we decide to forgive seven times seventy or turn the other cheek. But I'll tell you, God will do the unsurpassable in your life if you'll do that. Sometimes he works out the situation and things are restored. Other times the situation isn't restored but we're renewed in the grace that is all sufficient. Either way, that is God's insurpassable work in our midst. Either way. Sometimes you find yourself being asked to give in ways that you feel incapable, unable, or that you're in need yourself. I can tell you from experience, rather it's as simple as offering a meal to someone when you don't have a whole lot of groceries at home yourself. Or rather it's stepping out in faith to meet a need, like a project, that you thought, I could never help do that at our church. I can tell you no matter what, you'll find God's insurpassable ability to supply all your needs through his riches in glory. I know we've all lived that. In one case, I was appointed to, you know, I was a Methodist pastor for many years and I was appointed to my next Methodist church. I was going to be following a pastor who was highly thought of and a very, very nice person. Two things that I am not. And I thought, how could I ever do that? It was unimaginable to find myself in that situation. But I can tell you, and Paula can tell you, we went there for 14 years and had a deep, deep relationship and many joys in that time. God works in unsurpassable ways when we're willing to do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable. Then there's that third example. That's the really hard one. What about those times that really are hopeless? Sometimes we'll be like Elijah. We have to try to find a way to offer hope to the person in the unthinkable, hopeless situation as he now had to do with this widow who had lost her son. There's such a demand to try to do that. Sometimes we hold back because we say, this is too hard for me. How can I try to help them? Guess what? Elijah was struggling too. When he takes the son up to the room, he's going, God! What are you doing here? I say that to say this. Don't be afraid to be the one to offer hope. Don't be afraid to one to do the unimaginable and the midst of the unthinkable. Even if you're struggling with what it all means, just trust God to reach out. And another thing I really feel compelled to say here, sometimes when we reach out to somebody in that unthinkable situation of hopelessness, we'll find that it's often intermingled with their own sense of guilt and shame. So we have to be careful how we minister. A little tiny phrase in this passage, after her son dies, the first thing this mom says is, did you come here to remind me of my sin? What that shows us is often with hopelessness, people begin to feel shame and guilt. It doesn't matter if a thriller or a mansion, they feel game and shame and guilt. So when we offer that hope, when we try to do the unimaginable of restoring the hope, we have to be careful to do so gently. I'm so glad Elijah didn't say, well, what do you feel guilty for? Elijah didn't say, well, what did you do wrong? That doesn't matter. 
Elijah offered unconditional love and said literally, let me take your burden. Let me hold your son. Do the unimaginable when you're the one to offer hope. Other times, we're the one living the unthinkable. We're in the case. We're in the situation like the mom who everything now had been lost. Rather, we're the one to offer the hope or rather we're the one that's just living in the unthinkable. If we say, okay, God, I am going to strive to do the unimaginable, to trust you in the midst of the unthinkable, I'm going to find out that you provide unsurpassable hope. Romans 5, the very beginning of the chapter, ends with one of those verses I hold on to many times in my life. Hope does not disappoint. Can you say that with me? Hope does not disappoint. I won't say this morning we always get what we hope for. But God's unsurpassable work shows us that even when we don't get what we've been hoping for, we will never be disappointed in the one we hope in, Jesus. We will never be disappointed in the one we hope in, Jesus. That's scary. That's scary. The brook completely dried up before Elijah was shown he could go to Zarephath. The woman had to cook the last meal and give it away before more oil and meal was restored. Elijah prayed for that young man two times before he came back the third time. But if we hold on and we are willing to do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable, God will provide in unsurpassable ways. And we can experience like the beautiful psalm we read together this morning. His weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I've lived that. I've lived that more than once. In 97, my oldest precious sweet sister died in a horrible accident in her home. Every day for six months, I cried. Every day. And sometimes with some yelling and anger going on in the midst of it. Every day. And we were on a trip. It was New Year's Day and of all places I was on an airplane and God in his still small voice said, if you're ready, I can lift that burden. To me it was unimaginable that what I thought was permanent lump in my throat and permanent sorrow could ever be lifted. But I said, God, I'm ready. And God restored to me that joy comes in the morning. If we'll do the unimaginable in the midst of the unthinkable, God will move in unsurpassable ways. We'll know like Psalm 27, boy, I had almost fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But the psalmist saw the goodness of the Lord. We can live like Job in chapter 19. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Unthinkable situations do happen. Unimaginable challenges to keep on or to give beyond our need. Or to have hope when it is hopeless. Those unimaginable challenges will come to us. But when we do it, we meet unsurpassable power, unsurpassable peace, unsurpassable grace, unsurpassable joy, unsurpassable manifestation of the working of God in our midst in a real way. Amen.